Right guys, welcome back to another A-level forensic psychology video. Today we're going to be focusing on cognitive explanations for offending, and as usual we'll cover the outline bits first, and then move on to the evaluation points before finishing off with a six mark outline, so that you can see how all of this would fit together in 200 words or less. So let's get right into it. Cognitive explanations for crime are ones that look at the mind of the offender to try and understand what they're thinking in order to understand and explain their behavior. To do that, we're going to look at a couple of theories. The first is Kohlberg's theory of moral reasoning, which suggests that crime is related to judgments of right and wrong, and that criminals have a lower level of moral reasoning than non-criminals. The second group of theories focus on the impact of faulty information processing, and within that we're going to consider the role of a hostile attribution bias and of minimalization. So, moral reasoning refers to the process by which an individual draws upon their own value system to determine whether an action is right or wrong. Lawrence Kohlberg, who you can see on the screen now, attempted to create an objective measure for this process by identifying different levels of moral reasoning based on people's answers to moral dilemmas, like the one you can see on the screen now, and feel free to pause it and give it a read if you want to. Essentially, people were asked to read the dilemma and then decide whether the action that was taken was right or wrong, and then justify their answers. The more sophisticated your reason for it being right or wrong, the higher your level of moral reasoning is. And there are many studies that have been conducted, like the one by Kohlberg on the screen now, that have found that criminals tend to reason at a lower level than non-criminals. So here you can see the three stages of moral reasoning that Kohlberg proposed in his theory. As you can see, the higher the stage, the more sophisticated the reasoning. So offenders are more likely to be classified at a pre-conventional level of Kohlberg's model. And that's stages one and two. Whereas non-criminals have generally progressed to the conventional level and beyond. Now, the pre-conventional level is generally categorized by a need to avoid punishment and gain reward, and it's associated with a less mature, childlike reasoning. And you'll often see kids reason in this way, you know, you shouldn't do X because you'll get in trouble, for example. And in terms of criminality, it means that adults and adolescents who reason at the pre-conventional level may commit a crime if they feel like they can get away with it, or if they feel like they can gain rewards in the form of money, or increased respect, or something like that. And that's supported by studies that have often found offenders are more egocentric, and they display poorer social perspective-taking skills than non-offenders. It was also found that individuals who reason at a higher level tend to sympathize more with the rights of others and exhibit more behaviors like honesty, generosity, and non-violence. Okay, so that was Kohlberg's theory of moral development. Moving on, the next couple of theories are going to look at cognitive distortions. And cognitive distortions are faulty, biased irrational ways of thinking that result in us perceiving ourselves, other people, and the world in general inaccurately and usually negatively. And there are two that you need to know about for offending behavior. The first is a hostile attribution bias, and the second is minimalization. So a hostile attribution bias is a distortion in the way people interpret events, and it occurs when people lean towards thinking the worst about what other people are doing or what other people are thinking. In relation to offending, people with a hostile attribution bias have a tendency to judge ambiguous situations or actions as aggressive and or threatening, when in reality they may not be. And such negative interpretations can then lead to more aggressive behaviours. 
And there's very recent research to suggest that violent offenders are more likely to interpret an emotionally ambiguous face as aggressive and hostile. And that is the research that you can see on the screen now by Schoenberg and Just from 2014. Minimalization, on the other hand, is a cognitive distortion where the significance of an event is under-exaggerated. For example, by downplaying the seriousness of the offence or by applying a euphemistic label, such as saying things like carrying on the family business or doing a job or, like in the picture, thinning out the herd, which is obviously a very extreme example. Now, using minimalization helps an individual accept the consequences of their behavior, and it means that negative emotions that they may be experiencing can be reduced. And you often find that sex offenders will use minimalization quite a lot by downplaying their behavior, for example, through denial or by claiming that victims' behavior in some way contributed to the crime. And that was shown in research by Kennedy and Grubin from 1992. Okay. Right, so I hope all of those have made sense. Like I said at the beginning, I will put up a six marker at the end so you can see how it would look if you were going to condense it down into an exam style question. For now, I've got a couple of evaluation points for you. I've got four in total. And we're going to start with a little bit of research support for moral reasoning. And that research support comes from Palmer and Hollin in 1998. And they assessed moral reasoning in 332 male and female non-offenders and 126 convicted offenders using the socio-moral reflection measure short form. You don't necessarily have to remember that form, but obviously if you do remember it, great, but it wouldn't be the end of the world if you didn't remember it. You could just say that they were measuring moral reasoning. And they gave them 11 moral dilemma related questions, such as questions relating to not taking things that belong to others and keeping a promise to a friend, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And they found that the offender group showed less mature moral reasoning than the non-offender group which obviously um, supports Kohlberg's ideas that lower moral reasoning is associated with offending behavior. You've also got a strength for cognitive distortions, and that is the fact that it has very good real-world application in therapies. For example, CBT, which is the cognitive therapy of choice. Now, CBT aims to challenge irrational thinking, and in the case of offending behavior, offenders are encouraged to face up what they've done and establish a less distorted view of their actions. And studies have consistently suggested that a reduced incidence of denial and minimalization in therapy is highly associated with a reduced risk of reoffending. And acceptance is thought to be a really important aspect of rehabilitation. And acceptance is obviously important because accepting it means that you're not distorting reality so that you don't have to deal with it. And so that suggests that the theory of cognitive distortions has practical value in rehabilitation and therapy for offenders. And then on a final note before we have a look at the six mark outline, we have a limitation. Now, this limitation applies to both moral reasoning and cognitive distortions. I've got it in the same evaluation point here, but it's kind of split out and you'll see what I mean in a sec. And that limitation is that both of these explanations depend highly on the type of offense that is being committed. So, Thornton and Reed in 1982 found that crimes that were committed for financial gain were related to pre-conventional moral reasoning, whereas impulsive crimes weren't. And pre-conventional moral reasoning tends to be associated with crimes in which offenders believe that they have a good chance of getting away with it, whereas impulsive crimes aren't actually associated with that level of thinking because by you know, the very nature of them, they are impulsive. So that suggests that Kohlberg's theory might not actually apply to all forms of crime. Now, the same limitation also applies to the cognitive distortion explanation, because Howitt and Sheldon in 2007 gathered questionnaire responses from sexual offenders 
and contrary to what the researchers predicted, they found that non-contact sex offenders, who are sex offenders that access sexual images on the internet, for example, used more cognitive distortions than contact sex offenders. And those are the offenders that had physically abused children in this case. Also, those who had a previous history of offending were also more likely to use distortions as a justification. So that again suggests that distortions are not all used in the same way by all offenders, and that is, of course, a limitation of the theory. And just on that point, just bear in mind, you don't have to use them both together in the same evaluation point. I've simply put them on the same slide because it makes sense, because they're pretty much the same evaluation point. You can, of course, separate them out and use them as two individual points if you want to. You might even have to do that if you get asked to evaluate Kohlberg's theory of moral reasoning or cognitive distortions individually. Okay, so you can use them as individual points, but you can, of course, also just chuck them in the same evaluation point and make one really big, meaty evaluation point out of it. Okay, so just to finish off then, I've got a six mark outline for you. Now, there's nothing groundbreaking here, but I have cut a few things out and condensed it down into something of a shorter couple of paragraphs because there was quite a lot of information in the video and actually getting it all together can be quite tricky. So, I've started off with a very, very brief introduction to cognitive explanations, but because of how much there actually is to say, I've kept it quite short. I've then jumped straight in with Kohlberg's theory of moral reasoning, the fact that there are three levels, the fact that the higher the level means that you reason at a more sophisticated level, and that offenders are more likely to reason at a pre-conventional level. And I've also given a little bit of information on what that actually means. Now, as you can see, I've finished off that paragraph with a little bit of research as well, just to tie the whole thing together and to show that some research has been done and what that research has found, because obviously it is relevant to moral reasoning. I then have a second paragraph, which is slightly shorter. So this one is about cognitive distortions. Importantly for this one, I've chosen to not talk about both of them. I've just said that it's all about information processing, and then I've gone for the hostile attribution bias and what that means. And again, as you can see at the end there, I have put in a little bit of research. Now, obviously, if you struggle a little bit with the timings and kind of getting everything down, then there is some bits that you can take out um, to kind of cut down the word count a little bit. And what I would do is I would definitely keep my introduction, but I would then cut out this little bit of research. Even without the research, there is enough information there in your outline to kind of show that you know what you're talking about when it comes to Kohlberg. I would keep the second paragraph as it is. You have got a little bit of research in the second paragraph, so it's not the end of the world that you cut that first one out. Obviously, if you don't struggle with timings and you're quite quick when you write your essays, then leave both bits of research in. That's brilliant but um, it wouldn't be the end of the world if you had to take one piece of research out. You'll still give a good account of the cognitive explanations for offending. Okay? So that is the end of the video. I hope it has all made sense, and I hope it's been useful. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the comment section below, and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you in the next one.